89B. Just a little bit of review. Yeah. The question we were discussing yesterday was Kenyan Paris, Kenyan Aguftam, or Lav Kenyan Aguftami. One second. I'm sorry, no, 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 I'm sorry, finish that. No, one second. We'll, we'll, we'll come, we'll come, come back. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, okay. Qu the question of can you pay us? Can you go me? Is if you own something for its use, are you considered the primary owner or not? Mm -hmm. The other question we were discussing, and then we had the, the, what we call the Takanas Usha, Usha in, in uh, the town of Usha, they, for, they forbid, forbade a woman from selling her nifts and aluga assets while her husband's still alive. And we're trying to see if we can support or prove uh, another, an additional source that supports the, the, the contention of Usha. <clears throat> okay, now... One of the things we were, we, were, we were discussing was whether a woman could sell her the ksuba itself. It's true that Usha was referring to the nechsim alug. What about the ksuba itself? And the, the, the fundamental question is if a woman, the mission says that if a woman damages, she, she's exempt from payment until after, uh, until after she gets divorced or her husband dies. The married woman damages somebody else. Oh. She's exempt from payment. And the question is, why can't she sell the value of her the tevesana, right? The the, the uh, prediction market premium that maybe she'll die, and, and that should be the payment immediately. So we basically said that uh, you know she can always forgive it, and nothing will happen. Okay, uh, one second. We're at Ella Hadatanya. We're halfway out of the page. About halfway down the page, Allah Tanya. Kashem Shalit, uh, first one line is Esther Mechamisha. So the Bryce says, Kashem Shalit Timkar Vihitachtov, Kachlai Tafsid Vihitachtov. Just like she can't sell her ksuba while she's still, she's still married to her husband, so too she doesn't lose her ksuba. So the Gemara says, well, what do you mean she doesn't lose her ksuba? It is possible. Well, it is possible for her to lose her ksuba. How is it possible? Very simple. She, what she does is she she injures, she she assaults her husband. Right? Now, while it's true that her husband cannot, cannot uh, pay her for the, the value of the ksuba, the 200 zuz, you know, every woman has a 200 zuz ksuba that she must have. Plus is extras. So it's true that the 200 Zuz Ksuba ha has to stay. The husband will have to pay her 200 Zuz. But the rest of the Ksuba, she can sell to her husband mm -hmm. and that should be the payment. So she could actually lose her Ksuba. She has a very large Ksuba, much larger mm -hmm. than what she's biblically required to have. And the remaining value of her Ksuba could be sold for the premium. Maybe, she, maybe her husband will die first. And that premium can be given to her husband to pay for the damages. So when we say that she doesn't lose her ksuba, what, why doesn't she lose her ksuba? There could be scenarios where she where she injures her husband that she would lose her, she would lose at least part of her ksuba. So Amarava Rava says, no, no, no. When the mission here, when the mission here does not refer to that, it refers to Seifa Asan Ksubas Benin Dechren. It refers to Ksubas Benin Dechren, which we'll explain in a moment. Bahitani, this is what it means to say. Shem Shemacheris Ksubas Lacherim, Loyev Sidik Ksubas. Just like if she sells the premium, she does not lose out on Ksuas Benindichren. My time is Uzi Hudun Sua. Kachmacher Ksuas Labayalev Ksuas Benindichren. My time is Uzi Hudun Sua. So, what does this mean? When when we talk about a woman not losing her Ksuba, we don't mean she could sell her Ksuba. When, we, when, you, when a woman sells her Ksuba, what, what is she selling? She's selling the rights that if her husband dies or she's divorced, then the buyer gets to keep the ksuba. However, there's another rule of ksuba. Technically speaking, the husband does not pay a ksuba 
if the woman dies first. If his, wife, if his wife dies first, well, she, he could pay to her, her inheritors. But in, the, in this case, usually he is the inheritor. Right. So there really is nobody to pay. Except there is a catch called Tzuvah's Vindekman. Tzuvah's Vindekman is only relevant in one of two situations. Um, it is the, the, a man married two women and either one woman has more children than, than the other or their ksubas are different amounts. So let's look at a very simple example. Yeah, this man, Ruvain, married, you know, Sprinza and Yenta. And Sprinza has two kids and Yenta has one kid. They both have ksubas worth 200 zoos. And the total value of the state is 500. So now, if it were to be split equally, each child would get 167. Right? Now we have the law of Tzuvah's Vindekman. So let's say Yenta and Shprinza both died a long time ago. Reuven, Reuven outlived both Yenta and Shprinza. And, and Reuven dies. What happens now? So we say that each set, set of kids inherits their parents' inherits their parents Tzuvah. Mm -hmm. So what happens is Shprinza's only mm -hmm. child inherits 200 Zuz plus 33, the remainder. So it's 500 total. Right, she gets so she so he gets two hundred and thirty three, which is much more than one sixty seven. And the other kids, <laughs> they inherit two hundred zuz plus sixty six. Right, so they'll each get uh, what is it, one hundred and thirty three per kid. How did we get the five hundred? No, that's the value of the estates. Oh, that's the value of the estates. And that's for argument's sake. Oh, it, it could okay. be there. It could be more or less. The end of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, the, so that would be what Ksuba's Vindekren is. And if a woman sells her Ksuba, she does not lose out on Ksuba's Vindekren. Meaning, if a woman sells her Ksuba, she sells the rights whether whether her husband dies or her husband divorce, divorces her. But if she dies first, there are no rights that are given to the buyer. And the law of Ksuba's Vindekren is in effect. And whenever the husband dies, eventually, if they're... You know, if there's a need, Ksuvah's Vindekren might might mean that her children get more or less than the other inheritors. Okay, and the reason is just because she sold Ksuba doesn't mean she doesn't she doesn't mean she rejects the concept of Ksuvah's Vindekren. She sort of was tempted by money, so she sold Ksuba, but but Ksuvah's Vindekren remains in effect. Okay, Leima Takonatz Usha Tanoi. About 12 to 14 lines in the bottom of the page. First one line is Takonas Usha. Let's say this question whether a woman could sell Nuxim Alug is a Machlaik as Tanal. The Tani Chada, one Bryce says, Abdi Malug, Yaitzim Beshain Vayan, the Isha of Lolish, the Tani Idach Lolish of Lolisha. So what do we have here? The law is that a non Jewish slave, if you knock out his tooth, he goes out free. So here's the question you have a slave of Nuxim Alug. Right, the woman brought into the marriage is slave, and the question is who has to knock out his tooth, the woman or the husband? So one Bryce, one Bryce says, if the woman knocks out his tooth, then he goes out free. Another Bryce says, if either one of them knock out his tooth, he does not go free. Okay, so what's the debate here? So let's say this is the debate. My law, um, Savru, everyone thinks the Kula Alma Kinya Paris Lav Kinya Nagoftani. The fact the husband uses it does not mean that he owns it. My law, Bakamifiki, this is the debate. Manda Amar the Isha, let's say the Kanasusha. The one that says that the woman, that the opinion that says that the, if the woman knocks out his, knocks out the slave's tooth, the slave goes out free, that's because he rejects the opinion of Usha. The woman is considered a bona fide owner because she can sell it. She can sell the slave if she wants. So she knocks out the slave's tooth, the slave goes free. The other opinion says the man only has Kenyan Paris. So he can't knock out her. If he knocks out the tooth, he does not go, he does not go free. The slave does not go free. The woman, on the other hand, she doesn't really own it because she can't sell it. Because of the law of Usha. Usha said you can't sell it. Because why? It's her, what? it's her slave. It's her slave. 
it's her slave, she but the law of is that if you brought it in his next time you can't sell it. Because it partially belongs to her husband. Because the husband has rights to it, yeah. Okay, so the Gemara says not necessarily. It could be everybody holds the woman can't sell, cannot sell it. The two brights is the brights that says she, that if she knocks out his tooth, then he, then the slave goes free. That's talking about before they made the decree in Usha. Very simple. The other brights is afterwards. Another possibility is everything happened after the 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 enactment of Usha. The Isla, Usha is a town, by the way. The Islu Dakanas Usha, and everyone agrees to the law, the law that was decreed in Usha. Why, if the woman acts at a tooth, does the slave go out free? Because the laws of Rava, the Amar Rava, Rava says, Hektish, Chomets, Veshikher, Mafkin, Mideshi would. Without going into too too much detail, but basically, according to Rava, even though your item is, is has, there's a lien, somebody else. In other words, the woman's, the woman's uh, slave, is basically, you know, there's basically a lien on him. So much the lien is so strong that she can't even sell him. The lien is to her husband. But in the case of shikhar, in the case of freeing a slave, freeing a slave can break a lien. You have the authority to to free a slave, even though it will ruin it will ruin a lien. For example, let's say I borrow money from Jules. Right? Mm -hmm. So Jules is okay, I want a collateral. I say, okay, you have my slave. So so fine, we write up a document. Jules now is collater collateralized my slave. And what do I do? I go ahead and free him. Mm -hmm. Oh, one second, how could you free him? He's a lien over here, right? I don't own it. You know, I can't sell a car if it's owned by the bank or a house if it's owned by the mortgage company. The answer is that, yeah, generally speaking, that's true, except there are three exceptions. And this is one of them. Similarly, let's say I sanctified it. I, I gave it as a gift to the temple. It's too bad. You, you'll take a loss. A similar example is Chometz. I'm not going to go into it completely, but this relates to a non-Jew uh, collateralizing a Jew's Chometz on Pesach. And the Chometz is in the house of the Jew, where uh, also the non-Jew loses his lien. Okay, so the Gemara says, well, okay, if that's the case, Lema de Rava so maybe the statement of Rava, whether or not you can free a slave, whether freeing a slave will remove his lien. Let's say that's the debate between the two brises. So Gemara says, "Light kul alma isla de Rava." Everyone agrees to Rava. Bahacha amur rabbanon the shibuda de Baal. The the debate here is everyone fundamentally agrees to Rava. In other words, in the scenario that we had with, with, with me and you, with me and Jules, mm -hmm. we are, I borrowed money from Jules and I collateralized my slave. In that scenario, everyone agrees that, um, everyone would agree that the, the shikhar, the freeing of the slave, would remove the lien that Jules had on the slave. However, in the context of a woman, there's a fundamental debate, which is maybe the rabbis made the lien of the husband so strong that, that it's an exception to the general rule. Even though normally the truth of the matter is that if you free a slave, you can remove, you can, you know, explicate him from a lien, you can pull him out, extract him from a lien. But that is not true with regard to Nefsim Lug. Nefsim Lug is a much stronger lien. The same, another possibility is it could be both prices that talk about freeing a slave. The husband cannot free a slave. They both disagree with Usha. Over here, the question is, whose question is who's the primary owner? We plucked the Dahani Tanoi, and it's the following debate. The Tanya we learned. Somebody sells a slave to somebody else. So Reuben sells, sells a slave to Shimon. But he makes a condition. The condition is the deal is going to close. Actually, in this case, the deal the deal closes immediately. But I have another 30 days of use. Reb Meir, I remember Meir says, Okay, there's another law here called Yom Ayyamayim. The general rule is as follows. Let's say, let's say somebody murders somebody else, right? They take a gun, they, they have a, they take a gun, they shoot somebody else. 
except the murder doesn't occur immediately. The guy is critically injured and he dies two weeks later. What happens to the murderer? In those two weeks? After two weeks. Yeah. After. After two weeks. So he's, 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 do, you, do you have to, in order to qualify for capital punishment, do you need to kill him immediately? What happens if he dies two weeks later? The answer is it makes no difference. If he died from the original wound, then whenever he dies, um, within I guess some sort of reasonable time span, uh, then then the mur the murder the murderer is liable for capital punishment. There's one exception to this: if a man kills his own slave, then there is the rule of yom ayemayim. If he lives for a day or two, meaning if he lives for two days, then the man is exempt from from capital punishment. This law is only true of an owner of, a, of an Evitinani. It is not true of another Evitinani. So, for example, let's say Ruvain goes ahead and kills, you know, Zvulon's Evitinani, and Zvulon's Evitinani dies three weeks later. Ruvain is liable for capital punishment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now the question here is, the guy sells a slave, but he says, you know what, I, I want to keep him for another 30 days. And that's the agreement. Who gets the, who gets the law of Yemei Man? The seller who still has a slave for 30 days, or the buyer who will get his slave in 30 days? The buyer already buy it? The buyer already bought it. And the buyer. But, but he's right now, they agree that it's going to stay in the domain of the seller for another 30 days. This, so the buyer doesn't actually have the slave. Yeah. It's the seller that still has the slave for another 30 days. But the buyer already paid, right? So let's see. Yeah, he did. Absolutely. Rameyer, I remember Rameyer says, Rishon Yeshna B'dinyayim the, first, the seller, because the seller has control over the slave, he has the law of Yemei Mayim. Kasavar, Romero's opinion is, Kenyan Paris, Kenyan Agufdami. That having use of the item is like owning the item itself. He's the, considered the primary owner, and therefore he has the law of Yemei Mayim. Rabbi Huda Imer Huda says, Shani Yeshnev Din Yemei Mayim. The second guy, the buyer, he has the law of Yemei Mayim of two days. Because he bought him. Kosovar, because Yehuda holds, Kenyan Paris, Lav, Kenyan Aguf, Dami. Yehuda says that it, the, the owner is the owner. Not just because you don't have use of it doesn't mean you're not the owner. Rabbi mm -hmm. Yehuda says, Shneem Yeshnev Din Yemei Mayim. Both of them have the law of Yemei Mayim. Zeb Nei Shu Taklev, Zeb Nei Shu Kaspai. One, the seller, because he can, still controls the slave, and the buyer, because he owns the slave. Mesav Kalei, Rabbi Yehuda is not sure. Whether Kenyan Paris, Iki Kenyan Goftami, Ilav Kenyan Goftami. He doesn't know the answer to the question. He's not sure who the primary owner is. Mm -hmm. And therefore, of a Suffolk Nefoshis Lahakal. If we're not sure whether or not you have the law of being a murderer, then, we, then we're lenient. And we do not kill a doubtful murderer. Right? You, need a, you, need, you need quality evidence to convict. Rabbi Yezra, I Rabbi Yezra says, Shneem Einan Bedin Yemei Both of them do not have the law of Yemei Mayim. Why? Zelafish and a taklev, one because he doesn't have control, that would be the buyer. Zelafish and a kaspe, and the seller doesn't own him. Okay, if this is the case, the, the, the opinion of Rabbi Lazar that says nobody gets to, nobody gets the, the law of Yemei Mayim would be identical to the price that says nobody gets the law of knocking out a tooth. If either the 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 um, husband or the woman knock out a tooth, the slave doesn't go doesn't go out free. Whereas the, the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda that says that the that says that the one who owns the one who owns the slave has the law of Yemei Mayim, he would say that the woman who owns the Nechsimalog, she has the law of knocking out a tooth. If she knocks out the slave's tooth, then it would be problematic. If the husband did, he, the slave would not go out free. Come together. Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll summarize your moments. I'll summarize your moments. Amar Rav, Rav says, "My time is Rabbi Yezer. What's the reason of Rabbi Yezer? Amar Kroki Kaspehu, Kaspe Hamiyochedli. Rabbi Yezer says there's a major condition here, even though typically we have a discussion. You know, you can own something without using it. You can use something without owning it. And we have a question: Who's the main one? But with regard to the laws of a slave, it has to be Kaspe Hamiyochedli. You need both. You need to own it and be able to use it. And again, in the case of a woman, 
neither of them are in that category. None of them both own it and use it. And therefore, none of them have the law of of um, of knocking on the tooth. Kamana Oz Lahoda Omar Amemar. Who which this this then Amemar said, whose opinion is it like? What did Amemar say? Ish for Isha Shamakh and Nixon the logo also like clump. Page traditional please, Rabbi. Um we're on 90A, uh, about 16, 17 lines from the bottom of the page. First one line is Shamachro. Okay. So Ish for Isha Shamachro. A man and a woman, they sold it together. It doesn't make a difference. The sale is not valid. So the Gemara says, Come on, Rebeliezer. This appears to be the opinion of Rebeliezer. Rebeliezer says, in order to be considered the owner, you need to have both. You need to own and control, and neither of them own, own and control. And therefore, even together, they cannot, they cannot sell it. Mantan Lahodaton Rabbanon, who who is the author of this Brisa? Misha Chesiv Ever Vichetsiv and Khiran, Vikan Ever Shoshne Shutfin. You have a slave who's half free, half a slave. How is this possible? There were two owners, two partners. One of them freed his half. So the guy's sort of stuck, right? Vikan Ever Shoshne Shutfin, or a slave of two partners. Ain Yotzin Barashi Varum, they do not have the law of knocking out a tooth. Shain and Khaizrin that don't grow back. Meaning your tooth won't tooth won't won't, won't grow back. So Amr Le Rav Morchel Rav Ashi. So Rav Morchel says Rav Ashi. Hachi Hachi Amr Amr Mishmeid Rav. In the name of Rav, they said Rav Eliezer. It's the opinion of Rav Eliezer. Mili Amr Rav Eliezer. Kaspi Ham Yochad Le Hachan Ami Avde Ham Yochad Le. Just like Rav Eliezer says, you need to have both types of ownerships. You need to own and control. So too, Rav Eliezer also says you need to have singular ownership. If the ownership of a slave is split, there is no law of the slave leaving with a, with an eye or a tooth. Okay, let's uh, let's briefly summarize what we what, what we've seen. Okay, we started out continue, really really a heavy continuation from yesterday, which was the, the sort of is there any possibility of a married a married woman giving a payment to to her husband for assaulting him? Or for that matter, for somebody else. We eliminated somebody else yesterday because, in effect, it's always useless. <laughs> if she hasn't to fight with somebody and she doesn't want to pay, she'll just forgive the debt. So it's never really possible for her to sell the premium value of her ksuba or next time log because of usha to be able to pay it to pay to be able to pay for damage. Even to her husband, it's not really possible. The Gemara had a technical question. It seems that it is possible, and the Gemara's response is that. The Bryce is referring to something else, which is Ksuba spinning up bread. Even if a woman sells the premium to her Ksuba, she does not lose the general rule of Ksuba spinning the bread, which means that if she dies before her husband and then her husband dies afterward, her husband is inherited. Her Ksuba, as a component of her husband's inheritance, goes to her kids first. Again, this would only make a difference if there are multiple wives. Right, because if there's only one wife, so even they'll get it because of inheritance, or they'll get it because of ksuba, it makes no difference. Mm -hmm. There would be other differences, by the way. Let's say it would be relevant today also. Let's say, for example, a man gets married to a woman, the woman dies, and he remarries another woman. Right? So he has children from two kids. We would have the law of ksuba spinning would be in effect. Mm -hmm. Right? It doesn't have to mean that they got married simultaneously. Okay. Then we switch back to our discussion from yesterday, the day before, which was Kenyan Paris, Kenyan Akuftami. Uh, if you use is the use of the item considered primary or not? And we we spoke about Usha again, Usha, the Takanas Usha is that a woman cannot sell the Simalog. We had two contradicting Bryces. One Bryce says that a woman, if a woman knocks out a tooth of her Nik Simalog slave, uh, the slave goes out free. Another bride that says the slave does not go out free. Neither her nor her husband. And we gave a number of different different answers how, how to explain that difference. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a, sort of a brief brief summary. Let's continue. Okay, 90A. Some uh, some damages here. Okay. Somebody who blew a... Uh, I'm sorry. Rashi over here says... What? Okay. He, 
What, what, how do they say? The one who boxes the ear of his fellow. Yeah, I guess boxing is like punch. Really? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that, that's what Rashi says. Numbers. Yes, yeah, so the Kalech Avera is somebody who bangs his friend's ear. Or he shouts into his ear. There yeah, that, no, the, the shouting is the other is the other version. So shouting is we're actually you know screaming into his ear. Rabbi Yehuda, I remember Yehuda said, "Nice little seller." You give him a seller. Rabbi Yehuda, I remember Shmuel Rabbi Yisak really mana a mana. We'll have to see here. Generally speaking, we talk about premium currency. A seller is one is a mana is a hundred zos. A seller is four zos. So there are twenty five sloim in a mana. Rabbi Yehuda's payment is 25 times the payment of, uh, of the first unauthored opinion. Well, we'll discuss this in a moment more. Satray, he, he smacked him on the face. Noisen loy masayim zuz, give him 200 zuz. La'achar yodai, he, uh, he whacks him in the back side of his hand. So apparently it's more embarrassing. Noisen loy arva meyazuz, you give double, 400 zuz. Sorum ba'oznai, by the way, 400 zuz, you know, it's... Ten ten thousand to uh sixty thousand dollars. Tsaram Baosna, he he yanked the guy by his ear. Or Talash Basairo. Either either it means he pulled him by his hair, or maybe he uh you know shaved it all off. Rokak Vihigia by Roikai. He spit at him and the spit the, the spit was sort of visible on the guy's clothing. Hever Talisimimeno, he disrobed him. Pararaisha Isha, he uncovered a woman's hair, shook in the marketplace. Nicely, our ball may zuz. You give four hundred zuz just for the embarrassment, and that's an that's in addition. You also have to make the additional five payments depending on the circumstance. Yeah, for example, let's say the guy was the guy was uh, not really growing here anymore, and you shaved off all his hair. You know, there might be some permanent damage there. You know, Zakla, This is a general rule. I call it lefi kvaidai. It depends on the honor of both the one who was embarrassed and the one who embarrassed. Amr Bekiva. Bekiva says, no. Even the poorest of Jews. We look at them as if they were once wealthy and lost their money. Which is sort of how we make a reasonable approximation. We don't want to view them as having too much power. We want to view them as having still having a lot of dignity. So we say they once were, you know, quite noble, and now they, they, even though they lost their money, they still have a reasonable amount of dignity. Rainai sink ilo and prominent status. Rainai skilim bnei chor and shiyonim asem shalheim bnei Avram Yitzchak Yaakov because they're children of Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. Umay said there's a story about Echad Shapara Roshi Isha B'Shuk, a man uncover the hero of a woman in the marketplace. Basel of Nehor B'Kiva, so she came in front of her B'Kiva. V'chayvay litin law arba meizuz. B'Kiva said, okay, you have to pay four hundred coins. Omar Loi, so the man says to him, Rebbe, ten leads man. He says, he says, Rebbe, I'd like, like a couple of time. I need some time to pay. It's a big, big payment. Venus leads man. So Rebbe Kiva says, okay, you have a month to pay it. So what did he do? He hired a detective. Shamra, he sat there and watched her. He, he was stalking her. I made it up Pesach Hatzerah. He was stalking her at the front. He, he, he was discreetly observing her standing at the front of the courtyard. He, he arranged that a barrel of oil should be broken in front of her. In it was a small amount of money of oil. So what she do? She sees the oil for free. So Gil says for Aisha, she, she uncovered her head. So she grabs the oil and she starts oiling her hair. And they were, he quickly found witnesses. to you know He prepared the witnesses to be ready to testify. And he came in front of Rebekiva and he says, look, this woman clearly doesn't mind embarrassing herself by uncovering her fear in public. If this woman, for a tiny amount of oil, she's willing to uncover her uncover her hair, so I should have to pay her 400. So it's just, no, it wasn't, she isn't embarrassed that much. So Rebekiva says, you haven't said anything. Rebekiva sort of disregarded what, his, what he said. Somebody damages himself. Even though one is not, not permitted to damage himself. Potter, he's exempt. Even though he's exempt for damaging himself, and he, you know, is obviously a problem, he should not be self-mutilating. But if other people do it to him, despite the fact that he's doing it to himself, they are liable. If somebody cuts um, shoots, these are young young uh, trees, even though it's prohibited to cut down young young trees for no, for no reason. This is the prohibition of 
not destroying trees for no re- not destroying fruit trees for no reason. Potter, he is exempt. However, Acherim, if somebody else does it, somebody else cuts down his small trees, Chayovin, they are liable. Okay, Iboilu, question. Mona Tsuri Tanan, I'm on Medina Tanan. When we talk about the Mona, the hundred coin, the hundred Zuz, was it the hundred Zuz because it's a Mona of Tsuri, it's a it's premium currency, or Mona Medina, it's lower level currency, which is one eighth of the value. Right? So one eighth of a hundred is. Uh, uh, what 16. is it? Uh, what? 16-ish. 16-ish, correct. Mm-hmm. Less. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, 12, 12-ish. No, 12. 12 and a half. 12 and a half. Um, so that would be that would be 12 and a half, zuz, which would be two and a half. Uh, that would be uh, four, a little bit more than four times the payment as opposed to 25 times the payment of the first opinion. Mm-hmm. So Gemara says, Tashma, let's, exa- let's try to prove this. There was this fellow that blew into his friend's ear or he whacked his friend's ear. He came to Rabbi Huda. Rabbi Huda Nasir, Rabbi Huda Hanasi. Amalei, so he, Rabbi Huda Hanasi says, Ha, no, there is me. Ha, Rabbi Yisak Lili. It's the opinion of Rabbi Yisak Lili. Havle Manatsuri, go give him Manatsuri. Shmami no Manatsuri. Shmami no. So he told him, go pay a Manatsuri, a hundred zuz. Clearly, the, the mana we refer to is a hundred zuz. Okay. My when he said this, this is me and this Rabbi Yisak Lili, what did he mean by that? So we'll do the spoiler alert first. There's basically two resolutions here. One resolution is that they both agree to the same opinion, which is exactly what you might. They both agree. The mission has two opinions. The first opinion is Selah, the second opinion is Mana. So Rabbi Yehuda Anasi says, even though I have an unauthored opinion that says it's a Selah, I actually personally agree to Rabbi Yisak Lili, it's, it's a Mana. It's a hundred, not not four. That's one version. The other version is that this is a totally separate, totally separate point, which is the question of Aid Nasadaya. We discussed this in the past a few times, come up in Subes in the beginning and Dr. Ches in other places. What does that mean? We'll, 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 we'll see. We'll go right into it. Sigmar says, my my Ilay Perhaps this is what he meant to say. Ha I've seen the action. Oh, so remember here. Now, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, right? He sees something and he's ruling on the same matter that he saw. He's both a witness and a judge. So there's, I, I've seen it and now I would like to judge you. And also, the law of Rabbi Yehuda says it's a mon, it's a hundred coins. Remember, that would imply the Eid Nasadayan, that Rebbe, as a witness, could also serve as a judge. Make sense? Mm-hmm. Eric? Yes, we together? But Tanya, we looked in the bright. So Sanhedrin, Shiro, Echa, Chahargas, and Ephesh. So this is a, an odd story. So basically, the entire 70, the, the convocation of rabbis, whether, whether it was a convocation of 23 or 70, either one, they, together, they saw a murder take place. So what do they do? So some of them, become witnesses to testify. Some of them become judges to rule on the law. Diver of Tarifin, this is the law of Tarifin. Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Kiva says, Kulam edem him. They are all witnesses. Ve'en eid nasadai, and therefore they can only serve as witnesses. They cannot serve as judges. They have to go to a different court. Atka, like Omer Tarifin, Elam Tzasanasu edem, Tzasanasu diyanam. Even Reb Tarifin's opinion is that you can either serve as a, as a witness or as a judge, but you can serve as both. I will aid Nasadayan to serve as both like Amr. You can't do that. So how could Rebbe, who's a witness, also serve as a judge? Rebbe's saying, I know the event happened because I witnessed it, and now I'm judging on it. How could you do both? How could you accept both roles? So Gemara says, Itanya he, this price is can show the Lila, the Loyal Meba Dina. The Gemara says, no, no, no. Everyone agrees fundamentally that a, a witness could also be a judge. The problem here is that that the witness could be a judge if they saw the event on, and they're judging on the spot. But if, on the other hand, they saw the event at nighttime, a court is not permitted to sit at nighttime. They're only permitted to sit by daytime. So if they're sitting by if the court sees it by nighttime, they don't constitute a court. Mm-hmm. 
they must receive testimony to properly go through the you know the the, the normal resolution process. So because they so because they have to go through the regular resolution process, which involves people getting up and providing testimony. So therefore, we say that the, the witnesses cannot serve as judges. In other words, Rebbe saw an event. He saw this mm -hmm. blowing. So he immediately ruled as both a witness and a judge. Because he didn't need to hear the testimony. He didn't need to go through the process. The process happened in front of him. But, but if the process happens at nighttime when a court can sit, so he couldn't do the process at the same time, then we would say that a witness cannot serve as a judge. Another possibility is, this is what he meant to say, uh, I basically agree to Rabbi Yisak Lili that says the amount should be, that should be paid is 100 zuz, a mona. And then here's the witnesses that are testifying. Go give mona tsuri 100 coins. Okay. Once we're talking about Eid Nasadayin, let's, let's finish it. Does Rabbi Kiva say that a, a witness cannot serve as a judge? Vatani, we learned. Vahika itches for Eu, but Evan, I beegreth. A man will strike his friend, but Evan with a stone, I beegreth with a fist. Shimonatimani, Eimer. Shimonatimani says, Ma egreth miyuchet shemoser la Eda ula Edom. I've called shemoser la Eda ula Edom. Okay. Shimonatimani is a very interesting opinion here. Okay, Shimonatim money says that you have to bring the the uh, uh, the tool used to damage into the court, so we can determine if the damage is appropriate given the the vehicle of damage. So let's say, for example, the guy's fist is the damage, and we bring the guy in, we look at his fist, and say, does it make sense that this guy's fist can can create such a gash? Or if let's say the guy throws a stone, the witnesses actually have to pick up the stone and bring it into court. Of course, you must. Let's say they lose the stone, then, then they can't bring it to court, that we don't rule on the case. says to him, what do you mean? Does the court see how many times he struck him with his fist? Obviously not. We are exactly, he struck him in exactly what direction and what trajectory and how much force? Of course not. If it was on his thigh, or he hit him, uh, I don't remember the, the name of the the, uh, the bone, but it's the bone that's just beneath the chest. It's a very deadly, deadly... Uh, cartilage of the heart. Cartilage of the heart. Where basically it's a very sensitive place. You can So if you strike the guy in his thigh, presumably you have to hit him really hard to cause damage. Thigh is a strong muscular muscular um, uh, part, of, part of the skeleton. Whereas, uh, part of the body, but whereas the, the cartilage of the heart, apparently it's a very sensitive place. Diaphoid process. Diaphoid processor. Thank you. We are. You can do very, very moderate, a very minor amount of aggression and cause a tremendous amount of damage. Hold on. Let's say the guy pushes him from off off a roof. I mean, Rosh or from a from a from a, from a, a palace. Umes and he dies. Bezin holchanets labiro ibiro helachas etzal bezin. Does the court have to go to the palace or do you bring the palace into the court? What happens if the palace falls down? He has to rebuild it. Just like a fist could be described by witnesses, so too anything could be described by witnesses, whether it's it's a fist or a rock. They don't have to actually bring the rock or the, the palace into court. Okay. Okay, so... It's only in a scenario where the witnesses can't even describe the, the vehicle of damage. So it looks like he threw a rock, but we don't know and we, we don't see a rock around. So we don't really understand exactly what happened. That's when the man is exempt. But when, they, when the witnesses could describe the rock, they saw what happened, they described his fist, they described the action, that is sufficient. You don't have to actually bring his fist into court. Okay, Ketani Mias. The point here is that one of the items listed in the Bryce is Did he strike him in front of court? That they would know how much he struck him. Okay, what's the implication of that? That if they did strike him in front of court, the court would be able to rule on the matter. The court that witnessed the strike could also testify and could also rule on the matter. They can be serve both as witnesses and members of the courts. Clearly, Rabbi Kiva says they could serve as both memberships. So the Gemara says no. 
Like he was just trying to argue back to Shimon Atimani, but he wasn't actually arguing as if there was a legitimate something specifically legitimate that that of the the guy striking the striking the victim in front of the court. Rukiba was never making that argument. He was just arguing back to Shimon Shimon according to Shimon Atimani's own reason. Okay, have a great day. Yeah.